Now, what led up to you actually doing hard prison time for marijuana? Hard prison time? I didn't... What happened is that I jumped bail, and it wasn't exactly hard prison time. It was in Danbury, Connecticut. It was a federal prison, and it was, uh, I guess you'd call a medium-low security prison, and it was full of mob guys that, were, that had been in the penitentiaries or whatever, and they filtered down, and another act of serendipity, when I first went into the reception dorm, which is where they put you before they assign you to another dormitory, okay, where you're going to stay for a long time, I actually got a, a five-year sentence, and at that time you did one-third, and you got out on parole 20 months. So it was a, the mandatory sentencing had, was a long way from taking effect until then. And actually, it wasn't a hard prison time. I taught school there, and then, uh, and they assigned me to, ironically, a bunkmate called Carl Slater from Columbia. And Carl was in there for shipping, stealing cars and shipping them to South America. All right, not cocaine. But yet, he asked me, what am I doing here? And I told him I was flying pot out of Mexico. And, da, 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 da. and he said, do you know anything about cocaine? And I didn't. And he said, uh, you know, it costs $60,000 a kilo. Uh, then the wheels in my head began to spin like, you know, at, at high velocity. And uh, I said, you know what? I know how to get that out of there. And that's how it all began with him. And it was another act of serendipity. And uh, and we waited till we got out and, and then we went into business. And, you know, then I climbed aboard the, the starship to hell. So Carlos later, he was part of the Medellin cartel. At that time, there wasn't any Medellin cartel. There was just Carl Slater and I, and, and who later on, who I met, Pablo Escobar and a bunch of other people who didn't have a market in the United States, a major market or a major transportation system. And when it all <coughs> culminated and came together, then, like any business in the world, it became the cartel, like the oil cartel, the banking cartels, whatever. It was just a name, all right? And a group of people who were intent on profit and pure profit would stop at nothing to get it. So uh, how much did you actually deal with Pablo Escobar back then? I had only business meetings with him, and I... I don't know. I don't know if you can equate it in hours or minutes or moments or whatever, but each moment was an intensity unto itself. And it, it may have seemed like, like days, a moment with him. And, but I didn't stay there very long. I, I just, uh, you know, my purpose was to get the stuff in there, get the planes in there, and get get the merchandise out of there, and in in market in the United States, and bring back the money or whatever, because Colombia is a beautiful country, but it was consumed in in a, a violence that was becoming so intense that it, it was you know insensible to stay there any one period of time. Okay, now. There was a scene in Blow where you show up, well, you know, Johnny Depp playing you shows up and Carlos Escobar just recently uh, executed someone, I guess, for snitching. You know, did you actually see any of this violence around Pablo Escobar? Well, I don't, you know, there are certain points of the interview that I, I didn't want to go into, okay? I mean, it okay. happened, whatever, and, you know, the movies are the movies, and, and what happened is, is between Pablo and myself and... I don't wish to go there. Okay. So, at the height of, of your cocaine business, 
how much, I guess you were making $15 million per plane load of cocaine. Like how much money were you making back then? Well, what I was doing is charging for transportation. We were charging $10,000 a kilo to move it. All right. And some of the marketing happened with, with another individual in Los Angeles just hooked into the movie and, and record industry. But if I brought 500 kilos, okay, 10,000 a kilo, it was $5 million a trip. And I was making several trips a week. And then it grew to a thousand kilos of okay, cake and how much was I making a week was millions and millions of dollars tax free. Now, how much do you think you made the whole time? Was it a hundred million? What do you mean? My entire existence on the, is from marijuana to, to cocaine? Well, how much do you make just in cocaine? You think, I mean, if you want to combine it, that's fine. But Okay. Well, Several hundred million. Several hundred million in cocaine. Right. You think you made a billion dollars total during your well, whole Well, at that drug time, the, in the economy, in the equation of uh, compared to then and now, it was it was a billion. Okay, so you made the equivalent of about a billion dollars. What do you think? You know, what was the most extravagant thing you did making that much money? I went to Baskin Robbins. <laughs> what does that mean? The most extravagant thing, it's like, it's all relative and, and an existentialist question. I mean, what is most extravagant? I just live my life to the fullest, you know, with the intensity of a thousand suns and, and pursued the most beautiful woman on the planet and traveled all over the world and had a, a goddamn good time for myself. And after a while, when you're doing all that and you have total free will, nothing is extravagant. It just becomes, extravagance becomes novel. One there. One on my back there. You see it? Okay. One there, one under there, a few. Oh, so you got stabbed all over your body? Yeah. It ain't no lose or gain from that, you know what I mean? So, I don't see no reason to lie. Yeah. Punch, punch a little Quentin in his mouth. He seemed like a nice guy, man. <laughs>